thank you, uh, John, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here at the seminar and to join everybody for this. I know how important this seminar has been for more than a decade and a half, and I'm appreciative to the seminar and to the Freeport Center for this uh, opportunity. Um, obviously, it's timely. It's timely in one sense because of those terrible forest fires that all of you on the West Coast are suffering for and, uh, and all the issues that that brings to the fore. And also, of course, because energy and climate is going to become a new, one of the major issues or is one of the major issues in the presidential campaign. So it's timely for that. Uh, it's also time, as you say, because uh, my book is being published you know, slightly less than five hours from now. So uh, this is the first opportunity I have to really share and to talk about it and to talk about the themes that I've been wrestling with for the last few years to come out with this book, The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to discuss it here. Uh, when I use the term, the new map, it's primarily metaphorical because I talk about the new map of energy and geopolitics, but it's also literal because geography is really part of this story. In fact, um, the book's called The New Map and eight or nine months ago when we we're getting closer to finishing it, I said to the publisher Penguin, well, I got to get to work on the new on maps for the book. And they said, well, why do you need maps? I said, well, a book that's called The New Map has to have some maps, not too many, and there are not too many in the book, but the maps do help to frame the discussion. And so the maps, you know, what I'm going to do today is, you know, is, is try something new to, in a way to talk about it, not to provide a lesson on geography, but to use the maps in the book as a launch pad for the themes to highlight the important issues and, and help provide a framework. But just as openers, John mentioned, you know, as an author, and many of you will know two of the books, energy books I've done, one called The Prize, and one called The Quest. But in a sense, I don't know if others find this academics, but how all of your work comes together, because two other books that I've done also really resonate for me when I was working on this book. One is called The Commanding Heights, and it was uh, the battle for uh, the world economy, which was about state and market, and how the pendulum was swinging towards markets, and now uh, it swung back. And another book that goes back even farther to when I first met John, which is called Shattered Peace, which was a book about the origins of the Soviet-American Cold War. I never expected to be writing another book about an origins of Cold War. But as I was finishing this book over the last year, a year and a half, I really did feel that I was writing a book about Cold Wars. And I think it's become even more so, and I'll talk about that, but different kind of Cold Wars, but with both Russia and with China. Um, and just to give a little framework, as I was working on this, I, I was thinking that, you know, what did people think from, a, from when China entered the WTO in 2001? And it was a kind of WTO consensus that the integration of China would be a positive for the world economy, would be a positive for the United States. But even before Trump became president, that consensus was eroding. And now where it's really an era of great power, rivalries, the language, strategic competition. And kind of an underlying question of the book is where does that, energy is an important part of it, where does it lead? Where does it lead strategically as uh, between the world's two largest economies? And where does it lead economically as we see the supply chains which were taken for granted now under pressure? And, you know, Deng Xiaoping famously said about Hong Kong, now overtaken by events, one country, two systems. Are we headed to one world, two systems? Uh, and country, other countries, I find when I could travel, now not traveling, but uh, the question, don't want to be caught in the middle, don't want to be, have to choose. So that's kind of a, a, a overriding framework. So let's go to the first map. And this is a map of U.S. shale. Not all shale, it does include the Bakken, the tight oil in the Bakken, but this is uh, the revolution. This was a highly disruptive technology that disrupted the world oil market. The textbook said it couldn't work. It did work and it has worked on a scale that hasn't been imagined. Uh, before all of that was happening, the US was importing 60% of its oil. And the only question was how much farther would those imports go up? Today, the United States is the largest producer of the oil and gas. 
and that's changed a lot of things. It's changed the dynamics of the market. It used to be OPEC versus non-OPEC, then it became OPEC plus in 2016. Now it's really the big three, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the largest producer of all, the United States. And that was demonstrated last April when it was the United States that stepped in and brokered the deal between Saudi Arabia and Russia that stabilized the oil market, pulled it back from that bizarre situation of negative prices. Uh, this revolution has had many impacts that are not, I think are not well recognized, over $200 billion in manufacturing investment, a couple million jobs, manufact supporting manufacturing uh, in the Midwest, a balance of payments, but uh, revenues for governments. But it's also brought flexibility in US foreign policy. Uh, it's uh, evident whether you wanted the Obama approach to Iran, the Trump approach, or what will be the Biden approach, it would be very different if the United States was not the world's largest producer. Iran didn't think that the, Biden, uh, the Obama sanctions would work because they thought the world can't do without their oil. It turned out that it could. It's also uh, given us, uh, the United States, uh, degrees of influence and flexibility. I'm a member of the think tank uh, for the Indian government on energy. And I can see that there's an, a whole different element, a positive element to the relationship between India and the United States because the United States is import, exporting both oil and natural gas to India. But I mentioned, we saw how, what the Trump presidency did last April in the big three. Uh, we'll have to see if it's a Biden presidency, how different that big three will work. And in the book, I said, you know, it could be quite different. If I could have the second map, map now, this is the map of some of the really controversial new pipelines, uh, putative and actual that were built to tie supplies to new markets, uh, to new supplies to the market. In a way, these illustrate the divisions in the country between those who see this infrastructure as very vital, as a better way to move uh, oil and, and natural gas to, to markets, and those who don't want it to go ahead. I have a great picture in the book of uh, Barack Obama de dedicating the lower third of the Keystone XL pipeline when gasoline was close to $5 a gallon. Very different today, and that battle will continue. There's also the battle over the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is uh, essential for moving oil from uh, North Dakota uh, to mar other markets in the United States. Uh, if you don't do it, don't use pipelines, and the oil moves by trains, very long trains, uh, adding to the cost and also adding to uh, environmental uh, impacts on scale. But I think that when we talk about the environmental challenges to pipelines, they're really political challenges too prevent them from going forward and to uh, choke off. And there was a very interesting piece written by uh, Jason Bordoff, who runs the Center for uh, Global Energy at Columbia, where he, he pointed out that the same approach that can be used to prevent infrastructure, uh, new pipelines, could also be used against renewable uh, infrastructure. So something to keep in mind. That's the US. Let's now turn to the third uh, map, which is Ukraine. And this shows the Russian pipelines going through Ukraine. Of course, it was not a problem when uh, Ukraine and Russia were the same uh, country and the friendship uh, pipeline could run through Ukraine, uh, or the Brotherhood pipeline, but they're not brothers anymore. And there have been continuing crises with uh, between Russia and Ukraine over the flow of gas, over the price of gas, what the price will be, who's taking the gas, and that sort of thing. But two of them, particularly in 2006 and 2009, had very important geopolitical impacts because uh, in response to them, there's really a pretty dramatic change in the structure of the European gas market. And what the Europeans did is built much more flexibility into their system that they can move gas uh, in one direction or another. Uh, and secondly, uh, of course, with the development of LNG, of which the US is an important part. And so today, Europeans, whatever leverage might have existed in the past, the Europeans have choices. So in one sense, you think it's less political. But of course, in a minute, I'll say why it's become more political. But, uh, but that has meant that, the, that there's less uh, 
power you know, if Russia were to withhold gas because the Europeans have choices, they have alternatives. The Russians have responded by seeking alternatives too, building alternative pipelines. Um, the issues are unresolved and the underlying question is of course the relationship between Ukraine and Russia uh, and the relationship between Ukraine and the West. And really more than anything else is the dispute over uh, Russia, uh, over Ukraine, is really at the heart of what is the center of uh, the, uh, this new Cold War with the United States. It's what sort of promoted it. If I could go to the next uh, map, this is a map that um, shows uh, the Russian pipelines coming into Europe. And you, know, you see them coming forward like that. Uh, about 35% of Europe's gas comes from Russia, about 10% of its energy. So to say that the Europe is wildly dependent upon Russia is, is not correct. But it is that recurrent question of political lever leverage, which goes back like 60, 70 years about Russian exports to Europe. Uh, does that give them a chokehold or in some, or, is, or, or for Russia, is it that they need the markets? Uh, it had kind of become more quiet, but Nord Stream 2, uh, since the tension between Russia and the United States, uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline now has become the focus of great controversy. It's uh, an $11 billion project. The last December was weeks away from being completed when sanctions were put on uh, by the United States, which stopped activity on it. Uh, the premise, and there are more uh, sanctions that are threatened, the premise is that it threatens U.S. national security. I'm a little, I don't see how that pipeline threatens U.S. national security particularly because uh, the notion that you're gonna prevent Russian gas from going to Europe is, isn't correct. It's just a question of how that gas is gonna get there. Uh, and the, you know, are we actually hurting our security more by hurting the relationship with Germany? Uh, the Germans talk a lot about extraterritoriality in terms of our sanctions. Um, obviously, this has changed since the poisoning of Navalny, uh, the Russian opposition leader, and certainly in Germany, attitudes have changed too. Uh, and but there's new efforts to even put sanctions on a German port uh, because the Russian ships and the people who work in that German port, the Russian ships uh, use that. Um, raises a larger question, of course, which is, is our policy towards Russia only sanctioned or do we have any other policy as well? And I included in the new map a comment by uh, uh, Secretary of State George Shultz uh, in one of these earlier controversies in the 1980s, where he said sanctions are a wasting asset. And I think, uh, I think we see that again and again. And indeed, what uh, those sanctions have done have, has pushed Russia and China even more closely together. So it's not an easy problem of how to address relations with Russia. But the same week, within weeks that we put our sanctions on Nord Stream 2, in a very elaborate ceremony, uh, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping had a ceremony where they opened the Power of Siberia pipeline, uh, which is a very large pipeline that carries Russian gas uh, to China. Um, the other thing to just keep in mind about sanctions, and of course, it isn't just about energy, it's about a lot of other things, and in particular, it's about the U.S. presidential election in 2016 and 2020. But, you know, I think people who follow this closely think if that pipeline really doesn't go through, um, and maybe it won't go, we'll see how these sanctions work out. Uh, there will be a response in ways that aren't anticipated. I think one other thing to say uh, at, at the notion of stopping this pipeline is that uh, Russian pipeline gas has a new competitor in Europe as well. It's not only LNG, it's not only Norwegian gas um, in general, but it's Russian LNG. Uh, these were, the Russian LNG projects were uh, in the Arctic, people said, you know, they couldn't make it work. It is going to work. And probably what it means is an LNG market that looked like it was going to be dominated by a big three of the United States, uh, Qatar and Australia will actually be the big four. And Russia will be a big player in LNG as well as in pipeline gas. If I could have the next map, I'm now switching to China. And this map is the Nine dash, nine dash line map uh, describing the Chinese claims on the South China Sea. 
may, this may be the most dangerous map in the world because uh, of the issues about who controls, who owns the South China Sea, or is it freedom of seas? Um, I did some work in the French archives to find out how this all came about. And it all started in the early 1930s when the French Empire in Indochina was falling apart. And uh, three ships were sent out to claim nine little islands in the South China Sea. And this, they had a ceremony and they uh, blew trumpets and they left little things on the island. Really no one was there. Uh, word reached Beijing uh, and uh, led to uh, a sort of uproar, partly led by the ge ge geographers who were very much involved with talking about Chinese uh, national identity. And one in particular named Bai Mei Chu had in 1930 done a map called the Chinese National Humiliation Map about the century of humiliation, the European powers uh, taking uh, different uh, areas in China uh, and setting up their own uh, basically communities in control. And so in response to the French, in 1936, he drew a map for the new China Construction Atlas, which is basically that nine dash line map. The nationalists adopted it uh, more strongly after World War II. And then when the nationalists were rejected and went to Taiwan, uh, the Chinese government adopted as their, their map. Uh, but it didn't really become significant until the last 10 or 12 years. There is an energy dimension to it. Some people think it's about the oil and gas resources. Uh, the South China Sea today produces less than 1% of world oil production. Our own geologists at IHS Market and the company geologists we talk to do not think actually, despite what you hear, that it's very prospective of, of oil uh, at all. There may be gas there, but it'll be expensive and hard to produce. Um, the real significance of the South China Sea is that it is the most important body of water for world trade. And it is the body of water through half the world's oil tankers pass. And 75% of, of China's oil is imported. Not all, some of the courses from Russia and other places but a large part from the Middle East and uh, from Africa. And the fear there is that the US Navy, in the event of a standoff or confrontation over Taiwan, would interdict that, that oil. And that is certainly one of the strategic reasons that the Chinese have been so vociferous about the South China Sea. Uh, they've reclaimed 3,200 acres, turned uh, some of these islands and reclaimed territory into stationary aircraft carriers. Um, it was kind of quiescent under the Obama administration. The pushback against it has become much stronger now in the last three years. Uh, the number of missions, uh, freedom of sea missions, freedom of passage missions have increased. And we've heard uh, Secretary Pompeo and others ad advocate an Indo-Pacific community. And Japan, India, and the United States, a kind of tripart group uh, kind of pushing back uh, against this. There's no obvious resolution to this at all. And uh, finally, I conclude in some variant of mutually assured destruction, which was the Cold War, maybe the only answer will be mutually assured ambiguity. But it is, um, as I say, it's, there have been several near collisions. And in this kind of increasing tense uh, atmosphere, one worries that if there was a real uh, actual collision of ships, uh, what, how it would be controlled and what the consequences would be. Let me turn to the next map. And this is the six belt, the, the uh, belt and road map. Uh, you can see this shows the various routes for the Chinese belt and road uh, uh, strategy. But by the way, this is not all there is to it. There's been this question of what countries can be part of uh, the belt and road. President of Panama asked uh, President Xi Jinping, could Panama be part of the belt and road? Not exactly in Central Asia. And his reply was yes, because it's all about connectivity. That's the, uh, the, the, the connection. Uh, the question, is this an economic initiative? Is this a geopolitical initiative? Is it both? Uh, what it certainly would do is further embed China in uh, the world economy. The numbers booted about for it are you know, $1 trillion to $1.4 trillion, which in real terms would be about seven times uh, the amount of the Marshall Plan after World War II. Uh, 
energy is a very key element of, in it, along with providing markets for Chinese goods and Chinese growth, securing energy uh, all along the route. Um, but there's been backlash in some countries against it. Uh, discussion, some of you will know about the debt trap, that the, the loans that the Chinese are providing uh, cannot easily be uh, put, uh, paid back, particularly given what COVID-19 has done to emerging market countries. Uh, this is also, the Belt and Road has also further mobilized uh, Japan and India. Uh, there was recently shots uh, exchanged between uh, India and China, uh, but um, uh, kind of some uh, pushback. Although it is noteworthy that uh, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, a single country that's gotten the most loans from it so far is actually in India. So let's pivot now from uh, Asia to the next map and to the Middle East. Uh, this is the Sykes-Picot, the famous Sykes-Picot map that was drawn up in late 20, uh, 1915 and the beginning of 1916 uh, during World War II by Mark Sykes, a kind of author and amateur diplomat, and uh, Georges uh, Francois Picot, who was a French diplomat. And it was basically trying to deal with the uh, issue of the imminent collapse of the Ottoman Empire. What do you do about it? Something had to be done. Uh, the Russian Empire, by the way, was a party to it for a time, but then came the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, Leonid uh, Trotsky published the secret treaties, and that was partly the response where Woodrow Wilson came out with the 14 points uh, uh, and, and democracy and self-determination. Um, now, it was not just the Sykes-Picot Treaty. There were two treaties after World War I, but this is the origin of the nation-state system in the Middle East. Uh, and um, I, don't have, I don't have the map. But, well, I'll have another map that will say something about the oil part of it. But um, the three vilayets or eastern provinces of the uh, Ottoman Empire were yoked together to form Iraq, which was really a country where those provinces has then then, and to some degree now, don't have a great deal of con a connection, was done hastily uh, when Prince Faisal was installed as king in 1921, uh, as king of Iraq by the British. Uh, Iraq didn't have a national anthem, so one of the little details I found is they played God Save the King uh, as the national anthem. But uh, the resistance to the nation state system uh, in the Middle East uh, in its, uh, by the Muslim Brotherhood and extreme, more, much more extremely, of course, by Al Qaeda and ISIS, is a resistance. And um, in the chapter on on this, I start with a, a video that was up on the internet. I don't think it's there anymore, showing uh, ISIS militants on the border between Iraq and Syria, uh, uh, having set the border posts on fire, stomping out uh, uh, the border and saying, uh, "There is Sykes by Pico." is now dead. And so it has a metaphor that extends beyond what the map itself represented. Uh, and what the map represented, I didn't explain it, was a division uh, between the French and the British over who would have which area and which areas ultimately they would have mandates over. Uh, the next map is the uh, Persian Gulf. Uh, it uh, shows, you know, where oil was discovered in different uh, regions and, you know, obviously transformed that region. It also is a geopolitical map. Uh, Abcake is on it. Abcake was the 7 million barrel a day Saudi oil processing facility that was hit by Iranian drones uh, uh, 13 months ago. Uh, and, you know, if something like that had happened a few years earlier, there would have been panic in the world oil market. There was panic for at most a couple of days. Partly the Saudis repaired it very quickly. Uh, partly um, the fact is that that lack of panic reaction reflected the change brought about by the shale revolution in the United States, that suddenly there is this very large production coming from the United States uh, that is a huge stabilizer and source of security uh, in the global oil market. And I, at least I thought about the fact that there wasn't a panic reaction uh, had a lot to do with uh, U.S. shale. But what this map also points to, the reality of Iran versus Saudi Arabia uh, for hegemony in the region, predominance, 
but I would add, um, add to that Turkey. It's really a tripartite balance and it's striking to see Turkey under uh, President Erdogan invoking, shall we call it, its, its Ottoman vocation. Uh, this shows up too in what is a major new area of oil and gas development, which is the Eastern Mediterranean, another place where people said they would never find any uh, oil or gas, and now a very large uh, development of natural gas uh, in Israel, which will make Israel, uh, uh, if they, depending on the competition, the market, an exporter of LNG, again, something that would not have been expected. And, uh, but Turkey challenging plans for pipelines and distribution and so I think one thing to watch is a kind of geopolitical controversy related to these, this new play uh, in the Eastern Med. One other point to mention is just of great significance is the recognition of mutual recognition of the United Arab uh, Emirates and Israel. Maybe it's been overshadowed by other news, but to talk about reshaping the map, that is a, a new element in the new map uh, for, uh, for the Middle East. Well, at this point, my publisher uh, said enough with maps. I ran out of maps, so I have two last pictures to kind of explain the rest of the story. Uh, if I can have the next one, this shows on the left is Thomas Edison with an electric car, and on the right, uh, the reincarnation of Thomas Edison as Elon Musk. Uh, in 1900, there were more electric cars in New York than gasoline-powered cars, and Thomas Edison bet heavily uh, on uh, electric cars. And, uh, but there was range anxiety. But once Henry Ford's Model T's rolled off the uh, assembly line, uh, the days for the electric car were numbered. Uh, they last, they became known as ladies' cars, and then they became known as uh, doctors' cars in the 1920s, because apparently doctors like to make house calls uh, in St. Louis and other cities. Well, it's really an amazing achievement what Tesla has done to bring back the electric car. Uh, question of how fast does it move into the overall fleet. Uh, at IHS Market, we have about 800 people who do research on the automotive market and the automotive industry. And at least our baseline scenario is that today's 1.4 billion cars will be about 2 billion by 2050, and about 600 million of them will be EVs, and the rest will be still either gasoline-powered or hybrid uh, cars, gasoline and battery-powered. Um, but if, if with more government pressure, and in Europe, there'll be fines on autom automobile companies who don't move more towards electric vehicles fast enough, uh, that number could be higher. But it still hit me as I, was, as I was writing this that EVs at the end of the day are still cars, but what would be really revolutionary is what I call in the book, the triad. That is, if you take electric cars, if you take ride hailing, and you take self-driving cars, then you have a very different kind of uh, industry where you have uh, electric cars used uh, 24 hours a day or 18 hours a day. Uh, and you'll have large fleets of cars that can be centrally charged. And that would be, that would be really the revolution uh, in mobility. And I think people in this audience will probably have different views about the timing of that. Uh, but uh, we'll see uh, how that plays out but it would be a, 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 a different game. So my last picture, the Paris Climate Conference of 2015. Uh, and here they are when it's been, just been announced that they, the deal has been made, it's been accepted, the negotiations are done, and uh, the Paris Climate Agreement. And as I thought about it for the book, it really seemed to me that we can now divide um, the energy era between the uh, before Paris and after Paris. And it is remarkable to see how Paris, this agreement, has really become the benchmark for policy for governments. It's also become the benchmark for uh, financial institutions evaluating companies, uh, asking how their strategies comport with uh, Paris, the Paris objectives, and certainly for companies themselves, including energy companies, how do you adopt, adapt to the Paris uh, 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 benchmark. Um, this is, uh, and it's going to unfold and it will unfold more, could unfold more after January 20th. Uh, it raises a lot of questions. One of our major research projects now is about the supply chains uh, for a zero carbon future, as that has become the, uh, 
the nomenclature, the target, uh, and you look at the numbers, in, in one of our scenarios about getting to that target, you have to add in terms of capacity between now and 2050, uh, solar and wind capacity that would be double the entire existing capacity of uh, the world's electric power industry today. So these are very big numbers. The question is how fast they can they be done? So before turning it back to John, let me sort of end on a question, which is, um, question is, how does COVID-19 change things? Well, we certainly know, and it's kind of customary to say, that six years of digitalization advance has been compressed into six months. Uh, that, uh, you know, for so many people, you know, working in a distributed way is now possible. And companies have found that they could. In our own company, our CEO used to like it that everybody had to be in the office by 8 or 8.30 in the morning. Now he really kind of likes the idea of kind of everybody working in a very dispersed way, and by the way, not having to, to uh, commute. So, um, you know, coming out of this big question is how much will the office of the future be at home? Big question for Stanford and many other institutions. What's the future of education uh, after distance learning? Uh, will we see uh, le much less commuting now because people can work more flexibly? Uh, and what will that do to demand? On the other hand, and I think we see this in China, and my colleagues who work in China tell me this is the case, uh, people preferring to use their private cars because they're concerned about going on public transportation, at least for now. And we've seen that upsurge in, um, in uh, sales of used cars. Uh, it brought forward the era of big three that I talked about in terms of uh, oil, because it was really you know, you would not have imagined the U.S. brokering the deal between Saudi Arabia and Russia, who were really mad at each other, uh, except that uh, we had the clout to do it, and that um, really uh, the Trump administration thought that the, this uh, shale industry, the oil industry's existence was very much threatened. I think another thing that's really hit me is that it's, uh, it's kind of brought forward, again, the role of plastics. There's a lot of, you know, criticism of plastics. California is the forefront of it. But we've seen now the importance of plastics for food and sanitary needs. Uh, a hospital operating room, I have a, you know, an article about how much of a hospital uh, a section of the operating room depends upon plastics. Of course, the N95 mask, the much desired N95 mask, and all that plastic that you see in stores so that you can go in and people can shop. But the big question is, what does COVID-19 mean for the energy transition? Does it speed up the changes uh, for the reasons uh, that you know, build back stronger and so forth? Or does it retard it because of the staggering amounts of debt uh, that governments will have and the depths of the economic wounds? So uh, that's a question, you know, probably this time next year, we'll have a better idea of that, but it's a question for the seminar too. And with that, John, I will turn it back to you. Great. Uh, okay, Dan, that was a fantastic uh, tour through this uh, world that I think only you see well, and that is the combination of energy, environment, and national security, including superpower uh, relations and uh, emergence. Uh, for transition, I'm just going to ask one or two quick questions, some of which overlap with the long list of uh, audience questions. Uh, one is, as, as you know, we kind of intersected in Cambridge to Mass in the late 70s on uh, energy independence, oil security. We met in uh, Mexico City for a memorable event on oil security. And then to fast forward and get more up to date, in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, at some palace at a big um, oil uh, center sponsored conference right about when the book The Quest came out, which I think got you into clean tech and non uh, fossil energy. So with, with that background, I'm curious from my own personal point of view, and I'm sure the audience is, why did you write this particular book uh, in this particular way, frame this particular way at this point in time? You've already given a little bit of an indication of why that might be, uh, but I thought I would ask it more directly just to kick things sure. off. I would say that uh, even when I did Energy Future at the Harvard Business School, you know, around the time we first met, we had a big section on renewables that was way ahead of its time and, and in terms of expectations. I think in this book, you know, um, it's interesting how, uh, at least for me, when I 
the new map was not mapped out as a book. I mean, it really sort of organically developed. And, but what I was doing for myself and I hope for readers was creating a, a framework so you could see how all these pieces fit together as we go, as we enter, as we move through this era of uh, energy uh, uh, transition, but keeping in mind that the world still uses 84% of its energy comes from coal uh, but, and natural gas and oil. And there are a lot of other issues, all these geopolitical issues that are tied up with it. So that, you know, so it's trying to put it all into context and not be monochromal, but see a framework and how they see, fit together. And that's what I was trying to do. I had another objective, John, however, also, which was to make it shorter than the prize and the quest, because this uh. is the age of Twitter, and uh, uh, you won't see a you won't see a five on the page numbers in the book. It's about half the length, actually, of uh, of the prize. To my amazement, I just looked at it the other day. So, uh, following on this and syncing up with a number of audience questions, uh, I know you get paid big money to do this, but to the extent you're willing to share with us in public, what advice would you give world leaders, particularly a new U.S. administration? and folks like those in the, so let's just limit it to U.S. oil majors and U.S. Uh, electric utilities at this point in time? Well, I think we have to kind of divide it. I think for, you know, for government, uh, it's really the combination of both the reality of what we have today, its importance to the economy, its importance to energy security in some ways I've described, and that's very important. It was interesting when Joe Biden was in Pennsylvania, he said, I'm not going to ban fracking. He said, let me repeat, I'm not gonna ban fracking. I mean, if we did, if we went, it went away, the reality is uh, we would just import a lot more oil. I mean, given the structure of our economy, it's not gonna change. Wind and solar are not gonna really change the oil balance. So, I mean, it's dealing with that reality and at the same time, uh, moving forward, and I think that the real answers around uh, environment, around climate, you know, are going to be technology answers, uh, and um, you know, consistent spending, and that that takes time. Uh, Ernie Moniz, the former Energy Secretary, and I did a, a, a headed a report for Breakthrough Energy Coalition through Bill Gates's foundation on the kind of technologies that you need, and the answer is that you need technology. So I think the commitment to science is very important. I think we do, when you look at the companies, you really do see a difference between the European companies and the American companies. And I think part of it has to do with the political cultures in which they live, the political pressures they're feeling, and also, of course, pressure from uh, in investors. Um, the other day, I um, chaired a session for the Edison Electric Institute, which is the CEO group of uh, the industry. And I had Ernie on it. I had the head of NRDC, the head of the uh, Environmental Defense Fund, uh, and the utility executive. And um, you know, the electric utilities are generally moving, as they are in California, to uh, low carbon. Big point of uh, debate or contention is what's going to be the role of natural gas versus uh, renewables. But I think uh, the goals of sort of net zero carbon. Uh, are very much in the playbook for a lot of uh, electric utilities, but you also come away with the sense that they need, you know, you need, you need additional technologies. Actually, looking at the remaining questions, there's a couple of things that come up, and I know some of them are in the book because you were kind enough to share a uh, pre-publication version. One is, uh, how does this, pic how is this picture affected in your mind by two things, polar opposites? One is the move towards nationalism. And two, this is a student question, um, how is it affected by um, uh, the recent, do you think, by the recent spate of storms and fires, in particular here in the U.S., sitting in the U.S., western U.S., where the air is almost unfit to breathe at this point, and it gets worse as you go up the coast. Uh, how do you think those things will factor in? Well, uh, well I think the point? second one, the second one is clear. I think the hur hurricanes have been recurrent. And, uh, and have had you know, big impacts. And uh, I think uh, the Gulf Coast is bracing itself for another hurricane uh, as, as we're speaking. I think the forest fires, you know, this uh, apocalypse uh, moves climate change debate and climate change issues even more forward uh, in, in the discussion. And you can see that you know, the duel between uh, uh, 
uh, Biden and uh, and Trump on it. I see Biden, I think, uh, called Trump a climate arsonist, and Trump said the problem is forest management. So, I think this is I think this is going to make climate a, even a bigger issue in the campaign, and it was already a big issue. Uh, on the nationalism question, uh, that is interesting. That is this fragmentation. Uh, what does it do to markets? Uh, and it's an issue that comes up in terms of uh, renewables because, you know, as you maybe saw the article I had in Saturday's Wall Street Journal, and I took go much more in depth into it uh, in the book about uh, the supply chains for uh, renewables, particularly lithium batteries and for solar run through China. And so in a, you know, we now have a chip war, what does this extend further and how are they, uh, you know, going to fashion, how are they going to respond uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the current circumstances. So I think, um, I think if, we, if, if we put it in those terms, and of course, renewables give a degree of self-sufficiency. It's interesting when you look at China, half of the wind, half of the solar is in China, but China is still building three new coal-fired plants a month. So, um Quite appropriately, I think uh, there are a number of, now we're starting to get a lot of student questions regarding what advice you would give them. And this ranges for international relations fields to get into, technology fields, uh, all the way up to uh, kind of how can we be like Dan? How can we get to where you are in terms of framing the debate and influencing world, uh, world leaders? <laughs> You know, I fell into this just because I became obsessed and totally interested in it. And uh, well, maybe that's what advice in itself, right? <laughs> yeah, become obsessed. Uh, I was very fortunate. I had a two-year postdoctoral grant, and no one was supervising me, so I just followed my interest without thinking that I was. Uh, I didn't have. Not only did I not have a map for the new map, I didn't have a map for my life. I just, you know, one thing led to another, and in a way, I think, in a sense, when I write too. I'm aware that on the one hand, you know, there are big forces at work, but, you know, also a lot of things happen because of contingency, because of this happening or, or that happening. I mean, I, I was thinking the other day, if Richard Nixon hadn't answered an ad in a newspaper in the late 1940s to run for Congress, you know, he wouldn't have been president. I mean, that was kind of an accident that he happened to see that ad. So, uh, uh, but I think that, you know, I think it's what your students do is the, I, I think the single most important thing you can do is participate in a seminar uh, over, over the year or two years and because of the knowledge and the exposure you'll have to a lot of different thinkers and different approaches. But obviously the base of it is, uh, is education and, and, and research. Great. Um, I, I, I take it there, uh, let's see how you just follow on in a way. Uh, lot, there's a lot of emphasis in the student community here and elsewhere to kind of uh, send the right message by doing the right thing locally. You know, if how can we preach to the rest of the world if we can't run the Stanford campus, just for one example, sustainably? You probably hear and see a lot of this. Um, what would be, would be your advice to the, uh, those folks about the priority you would put on them doing that as opposed to um, working more with people in some of the other um, industries and regions, say? Well, I think that, you know, you have to ask what is a real carbon footprint? What is the impact? I think what has impact, you know, I, in, in the new map, I have a, uh, a chart that just shows where the carbon emissions are coming from. And, uh, you know, I think it's really the, you know, the big issues are, are emissions in the, um, in the emerging markets. Uh, it's China, it's India. Uh, that's where you would have real impact. I mean, it, it's striking to me that U.S. carbon, you know, CO2 emissions are down to the levels at the beginning 1990s, although our economy has doubled. And a lot of that's because we've replaced coal with, with natural gas. So, you know, I think being engaged is, is important and it's motivating and, it, and it, it, you get involved in it. But I think, you know, the big impacts are going to come where the big numbers are. Yeah, back to the storyline re related to that, we do get a large number of students interested in quote unquote international relations who are now more interested 
in energy, energy environment. So a general question from your point of view, maybe a final one is, how worried are you about the um, deterioration of all the old uh, international uh, alliances? Uh, I uh, have quite a lot of concern about it. I think one of the United States, I know you have a very, a very international student body, but one of the strengths of the United States has been its alliance system, its relationship with the Europeans, with Japan, with newly developing relationship with India. Uh, and I think that those two, I think that's a real source of stability. I think the weakening of international organizations is a subject of concern. Uh, the way uh, the, the, the lack of national uh, collaboration on COVID-19 is a very good point of, uh, of it not working. And then these, uh, the, the growing rift between China and the United States, I, I mean, you know, on both sides, it's, it's uh, that polarization is increasing. I mean, I always thought, you know, the fact that there are 362,000 Chinese students in the United States was a good thing because it tied it together. Obviously, uh, one reads now that some of them, you know, were there, uh, they, disguising the fact that they were from the People's Liberation Army or they have other missions. But I think um, the kind of breakdown of that relationship uh, is quite worrying and it's not where it is now, but where is it gonna be in two or three years? Uh, how do you stabilize that relationship? Uh, and you look at historical analogies and, and it is concerning. As I said, you know, I went back to that element of contingency. You know, what happens if, uh, ships collide, uh, what happens if there's some kind of exchange like happened between Indian and Chinese soldiers a few weeks ago uh, in the South China Sea? How do you control that on, um, given the polarization? So I am a, by uh, temperament an optimist uh, and a positive thinker, but I think one does have to be realistic about these risks and ask how do we manage them and uh, not just assume that they can go on. So I think for the students you know, of international relations, people focused on that. Um, uh, it's there. And of course, there are whole new ways of uh, countries to be at war or in combat with each other, beginning with cyber war. And we've had some taste of that. And uh, so there are vulnerabilities there. So I think, um, you know, I think that's where I would caution. And, you know, I concluded, and, you know, I think People find a lot of positive messages and content in uh, in the new map, but I do say that uh, you know just looking at what's happened since 2001, how many surprises and unexpected developments have happened from 2001, the financial crisis, uh, uh, COVID, and I do have a section on a chapter called the plague that looks at the question of why you know why did this come as such a surprise, this situation we now find ourselves in. But I say that there, you know, there'll be surprises, but I think there, there are two constants out there. One is wrestling with the issues of climate, and the other is, in fact, uh, the clash of nations. And so I think it's important to see how these all fit together. Uh, and I've tried to do that and do it in a, in a narrative way as well as an analytical way uh, to mm -hmm. kind of give a, a framework at a time of great change. Just to wrap up, I lied. One more question, just to be fair to the economist. Well, I, I, I'm interested how you think about uh, the efficacy of taxing carbon or taxing greenhouse gases, which we hear even our uh, beloved colleague and inspiration, George Schultz, favors that as a main solution. What role do you think uh, greenhouse gas or carbon taxing will play in the uh, solution to these problems as we go ahead? Well, I think, of, uh, you know, I think, uh, that other book I mentioned, Commanding Heights, I came out of it, you know, how should I say, with a lot of respect for actually uh, prices as, a, as a little pieces of information that tell you what to do. And so uh, I think rather than jerry-built system of regulations and, uh, and mandates that, you know, that don't allow a lot of room for flexibility, adjustment, and innovation, I think a carbon tax or carbon pricing would be uh, you know, a very efficient way to go about it. Um, you know, it's always been, you know, who wants to stand up and vote for taxes? Some people think maybe it'll be easier now because the government will need a lot of money. 
uh, of course, it's progressive, but George Schultz and others say, you know, we, we recirculate it uh, back to, to people. So I think that um, using a price is a, would be a, probably the most efficient way to do this uh, and the one that would promote the most innovation and maybe the fastest adaptation. Great. Well, at this point, we're a little bit over time, in fact, so I'd like to thank you for uh, presenting this work so eloquently and impactful and giving us a sneak preview on your right. latest magnus opus and tour de force. So yeah, congratulations well, congratulations you, on another successful uh, uh, achievement. Um, well, and if this, this one doesn't win a Pulitzer Prize, it should. Well, the system you. is right. Yeah. Well, Great. Thank you. Thank, John, you. thank, thank you. you so much. We owe you a trip out here at some point. Uh, hopefully right, exactly. Hopefully not too distant okay. future. Yeah. But uh, thank you. It was very meaningful for me to the, the, the seminar Good. to have the chance to do this, uh, you know, four hours and three minutes before publication. Yeah, sure. and then a group well, of lucky well, students, a small group of lucky students are going to get a chance to uh, right now to chat with you for maybe 20 minutes longer. So well, thank you. Thank you for that as well. So thanks once again. Uh, we, we owe you a lot, uh, both as an audience and as citizens of the world.